Hey everybody, it's Party Lead, and today we're taking a look at the upcoming turn-based tactics game, Warhammer 40k Chaos Gate Demon Hunters. You might have seen a video about the game on this channel previously, and you may have seen it mentioned as one of my most anticipated strategy games of the year too, but today's video comes on the back of a couple of digital preview events I was able to attend earlier this year, which means all the information I have to share with you today is a result of actual hands-on gameplay experience. So you'll be seeing my own gameplay footage, you'll be seeing some B-roll footage as well, and you'll be getting some information that I got not just through experiencing the game, but through conversations with the developers too. So a big thanks goes out to the developers for inviting me to these events so I can check things out and share a bunch of interesting intel with you. And if you're interested in grabbing the game ahead of its May 5th release, doing so at the link in the description down below helps support the channel as you buy. Now, with all that said and done, let's dive right on in. A rough starting situation. Playing as the Grey Knights is a powerful position to find yourself in. These guys are the military arm of the Ordo Malleus, the oldest branch of the Imperial Inquisition hunting literal demons that enter our mortal plane. If you're not familiar with 40k lore, those might just sound like a jumble of words, but to put it plainly, these are some of the most hardened and well-equipped warriors amongst even the biologically engineered space marines of the Imperium of Man, and they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the most terrible and terrifying enemies it ever has to face. Yes, I'm a little partial to the Grey Knights, and there's certainly an argument to be made about other Space Marine chapters being just as impressive, but I've always thought the Grey Knights were especially cool, and I've always felt as though they deserved more attention in other media. So here we are. But as you can imagine, a game, especially a strategy or tactics game, isn't so fun if there's no challenge involved, and apart from putting you up against some formidable foes as you make progress through the game, it also keeps you in check early on as it sets the stage as well. Your task force has just finished a mission. It's low on supplies and your ship, the Baleful Edict, isn't operating optimally either. But rather than return to safe harbor to top up and head back out, you find yourself needing to respond to a rather urgent situation. A strange demonic plague has started to spread in a distant sector. The bloom spreads the influence of the chaos god Nurgle, and you find yourself in the unenviable position of needing to tackle this new problem before it festers and becomes unstoppable. While there is a clear focus on Nurgle as the primary enemy, the developers haven't entirely excluded the possibility of other enemies of the Imperium making an appearance. In fact, our time with the game showed at least one other Chaos God at play, and the developers were very coy, in my opinion, with regards to future plans as well. To me, that says if the game sells well, we might see more than just Nurgle, and perhaps more than just Chaos? After all, I can think of at least one other biologically inclined race in the 40k universe. Either way, at release, it's focused around Nurgle, yes, but there are hints at other things going on behind the scenes as well, both in the game and out. Either way, Chaos Gate Demon Hunters pulls no punches. It intends to have you put everything on the line, and much to my absolute pleasure, that includes the lives of your marines, with a form of permadeath that makes sense in the context of these bioengineered super soldiers, which I'll touch more on in just a little bit. The opening mission throws your marines into the thick of things as cultists summon greater demons onto the battlefield in the tutorial missions itself just to set the tone with a tease of things to come, and you'll find yourself pit against a constantly evolving enemy, literally and metaphorically speaking, as more enemy variants get revealed and older variants get modifications to make them stronger, sometimes in the middle of your tactical engagements. Not only that, but the Morbus tracker that ticks along constantly is a reminder of the price of failure. As the days go by and as certain objectives are missed because you're overwhelmed by the threat, you'll see this tracker point out the progress of the bloom, and upon crossing a certain threshold, you'll have failed your mission as it swallows the system whole. Demon Hunters clearly wants to challenge players along the way, and at least during our gameplay session where we played a few missions from different stages of the game, it felt like it was putting up a solid fight. But Enough talk about the setup, let's take a closer look at some of the mechanics. A system spanning strategic layer. 
The best turn-based tactics games have a solid strategic layer acting as the glue that holds everything together, at least in my opinion, and the developers of Chaos Gate Demon Hunters have built a very interesting set of mechanics to do exactly that. As mentioned previously, your overall task is to eliminate a new threat before it grows too strong, and there are a few different types of missions appearing across an entire system's worth of planets that you'll take on in order to do so. Plot-driven narrative missions will have extremely unique and specific objectives that drive the story forward while giving you something very interesting to do. We've been told by the developers explicitly that the intent is to avoid the generic objective of simply killing all the enemies, though that will of course come up at times. These will have more tailored goals and narrative beats that reveal the greater story at play. At the same time, the spread of the bloom will provide what are generically referred to as bloom missions, and these are combat excursions meant to stop the spread of the bloom on individual planets depending on the current state of the spread at said planet. Here, a variety of mission types with different sets of objectives will keep things interesting between story missions. From the sound of it, there are enough variables to keep these randomly generated missions different enough from each other and avoid the typical slog that can accompany this approach, and I'm really glad to hear that because it can really make or break the experience outside of those story missions. For example, the current state of the bloom on the specific planet where your mission is taking place will determine the mission's overall objectives and the state of the resulting battlefield as well. The planet itself will influence the type of layouts and spaces you'll be engaging in, and the strain of the bloom will determine the specific flavor of enemies you're likely to see, while the level of corruption on the planet might determine how likely you are to see evolved variants of your opponents right off the bat or over the course of a mission. Again, all these variables encourage you to consider your loadouts before diving in. You know, will your enemy be more likely to resist status effects because of an active strain on the planet? Will you need to worry about penetrating higher than usual armor levels? Is this a mission you can take greener marines on to level them up a little? You can see how the bloom isn't just set dressing, but instead takes a central role in some decision making that you'll need to do. Leaving these side missions unattended or failed means allowing the bloom to fester, but trying to engage with every instance of the bloom involves managing your resources and building for that purpose in the first place. This takes us to a major aspect of the strategic layer, upgrading your ship. For example, at the start of the game, your warp drive is badly damaged, slowing you down. If you intend to tackle the bloom effectively, you might want to focus on upgrading this sooner rather than later. Similarly, spread across three categories, you can upgrade your reactor to unlock higher tier upgrades. You can improve the rate at which you gain servitors, the rate at which you build, the rate at which you complete research, the prevention of warp storm events, your hull integrity, your weapons, and your ability to execute exterminatus. You can increase the space you have for your space marines, and you can improve the level at which you can recruit them in the first place. Meditation chambers help them gain XP faster, while Apothecarians help improve the rate of recovery or help store fallen brothers. Finally, more Prognosticars can be added to your ship as well, which is another resource that can be used in a variety of ways for a variety of buffs. As you may be able to tell looking at these screens, Servitors and Time are your two consumable resources as far as these upgrades and repairs are concerned, while Research primarily requires Time with seeds you've collected being consumed for higher level research. Research can unlock new tools, new abilities, buffs against specific enemy types, purity seals, and additional resources as well as, seemingly, story beats. Research also gives access to more and more stratagems, special abilities that you can use on missions that aren't tied to any specific space marine, and can actually turn the tide of battle in a pinch. They offer everything from healing, to pinning enemies in place, to causing extra damage, to higher crit chances, and more besides. So, as you're moving from planet to planet, chasing after the spread of the bloom, you're spending resources to upgrade your ship and your combat capabilities, research the enemy, and even requisition further equipment from Titan when possible. You're engaging in conversation with various crew members, learning more about the setting and the threat you're up against, and you're planning your moves in a way that maximizes your chances of success, while at times needing to hand the enemy an advantage so that you can come back stronger later. 
The strategic layer of Demon Hunters is dense, and we haven't even touched on unit progression. As time progresses in a game like this, so too must your capabilities. We already touched on how your ship and technology move forward over time, but that means very little if your actual combatants don't do the same. To that effect, your Space Marines will gain XP over time, and you can spend it to acquire various buffs and boons like the health, willpower, damage, or crit chance stats, or all new skills and abilities. First and foremost, it's important to note that each Marine has their own class, and each class will have its own skill tree with some occasional overlap, but largely different special abilities and at times exclusive equipment too. Some will have access to Terminator armor, and all will eventually have access to mastercrafted items from the Armory of Titan itself, further along in your campaign. There are hundreds of such unique named items that can be requisitioned using resources, and by applying purity seals to them, you can actually upgrade them even further, allowing for some progression to your equipment too, and a fair bit of customization. There are four classes and higher level variants of the four classes, including the Justicars, Purgators, Interceptors, and Apothecaries, and they each serve their own role and work best in their own ways. Apothecaries, for example, are an essential support class to help with healing in various ways, depending on the tools you've unlocked for them. They can either heal from range or only from adjacent tiles, and again, it's determined by how you've upgraded them, what equipment you've given them, and how willing you are to take certain kinds of risks and the value proposition of the different skills and abilities as they upgrade. Other classes include heavy hitters in melee, uh, some who gain access to the cleansing flame and zone of control provided by the Promethean spewing flamers, so on and so forth. Each marine will also have access to their own pool of hit points and willpower, and they'll also have stats for armor, movement speed, and resilience. That last one is particularly interesting. The developers wanted to include permadeath as a feature, but they wanted to be careful about managing the lore around something like that. It's not easy to permanently kill something so durable as a space marine, and yet without the threat of loss, these games can sometimes feel a little flat. So to tackle all that, while keeping things interesting, the devs have introduced a resilience stat that determines how many critical wounds one of your knights can take before they're completely down for the count and need to return to Titan to recover. There was also mention of a place for Fallen Brothers to be stored, so to speak, so I imagine there is a very firm sense of permadeath to be had here too. I assume this icon here represents the current number of critical wounds versus the maximum, based on resilience, and any critical wounds can be healed if your ship is appropriately upgraded and enough time is spent on the matter. Depending on your overall difficulty settings and further ways you can fine-tune your difficulty, you can bring this resilience stat right down to a single critical wound, immediately wiping out one of your knights. As you can see on this screen, you'll have access to 8 berths early on, and with repairs to your barracks and upgrades to your barracks as well, you'll unlock more and more berths where you can keep more and more knights, so you're able to swap them in and out of missions based on their stats, abilities, and current status, like if they're near death or not. I love that this is an actual aspect in the game. It makes the strategic layer so much more important, and it makes unit management an actual concern. In this genre, in my humble opinion, the attachment to a character is a lot more real and meaningful if you can actually stand to lose them. So this really enhances the game for me. There's honestly nothing like losing a highly trained, skilled individual because of your own overconfidence, and it forces you to upgrade your barracks so you actually always have backup on hand, and you're actively making sure everyone's improving at the same time. It applies pressure and introduces tension in a very tangible and real way, and I absolutely love it. Now, you're not the only one seeing the effects of progression, though, because you're up against an evolving threat. The enemy, as touched on earlier, evolves over time as well, particularly through mutations. These mutations are influenced by the specific strain of the bloom infecting a certain region, with each of the five strains having slight thematic differences. So, one might be more about damage output, another might be more on the defensive front, so on and so forth. Now, what's really cool is that there are visual aspects to these mutations, so you'll actually see enemy units that have grown spikes or 
tentacles or other such demonic gifts to reflect their mutations, and each enemy type has different types of evolutions and mutations that may or may not appear depending on triggers at play. These mutations will apply modifiers to the base enemy, again, depending on the active strain of the bloom in the area. They'll sometimes get buffs to damage output or buffs to their armor or buffs to resistance to status effects. It really depends on the active strain in the area, and so it'll change depending on the mission you're on and the situation planet side. Now, each enemy type also has at least one mutation that's independent of the strain and that impacts something very specific to that enemy type, perhaps improving one of its weapons or one of its abilities that only it has access to. Now, what's really interesting to me is that mutations work in two different ways, speaking in broad terms. Depending on the corruption level of a planet, it's possible that the enemies you'll be facing on your mission will begin with some degree of evolution and mutations already applied to them. This serves as a bit of a warning to you, as you'll be able to guess what kind of mutations you're likely to see, and you can choose to prepare accordingly. Again, seeing the strain of the bloom that's active on a planet will help you determine what you might need to prepare for. Oh, the enemy's going to be harder hitting this time, or the enemy's going to be harder to hit this time and I should get more armor piercing weapons or perhaps I should avoid using status effects because the bloom over here is likely to make these guys resistant to status effects. It really introduces this extra layer of strategy as you prepare to dive in on a mission and I think that's fantastic. Now the other way mutations can rear their ugly head is in the middle of a mission. It seems as though there are a few different things that can trigger a mid-mission mutation. At times, targeting an enemy with an attack seemed to have a chance of causing a mutation, and more consistently, warp surges could trigger mutations across all enemies that were standing at any given time. Warp surges occur periodically during a mission, and the longer you take to complete one, the more warp surges you'll see, which in turn means the harder your mission will get. This is a very fun way to keep you on your toes, and the unique evolutions are particularly entertaining since they're not just generic stat buffs, and there's something new to discover with every new enemy type. The very battlefields you fight on will evolve in a way too. While you might return to the same planet multiple times in the playthrough, the progress of the bloom will determine how the map looks, feels, and operates, and the type of mission you'll have to take on might change as well depending on the progress of the bloom on that specific planet too. If you make it to a planet during the early seeding phase, for example, you can cut the corruption off before it sets. The objective for seeding missions involves finding specific enemy units that are carrying the seeds of this plague, eliminating them, and collecting said seeds. In flowering missions, which occur later on in the life cycle of the plague, you might be required to prevent the completion of a ritual that might further the game towards total failure through the aforementioned Morbus Tracker. The enemy evolves in more ways than one in Demon Hunters, and you need to keep up if you want to shut it down. Now, let's talk about the meat of the game, where all the more literal action takes place. Visceral Tactical Battles A significant portion of the game takes place off the ship, and this is especially where Demon Hunters is looking to put the grim in grim dark. Your Space Marines stomp around the battlefield, facing off against enemies that range from the small, squishy type to the larger, more likely to explode kind. And Demon Hunters does a great job of making the action feel fast, responsive, and snappy. Bulky as they are, your marines will jump gaps, leap up and off ledges, and will just move around at a decent pace while still maintaining a sense of weight to them, though some will be limited by their class, adding an extra layer to mobility. This really helps tackle a common issue in this genre where things can start to feel a little slow and plodding. With just four marines on your side at any given time and the aforementioned snappiness though, Things move pretty quickly, and the occasional zoom in for a flashy cinematic angle is great, especially for some of the more tongue-in-cheek humorous moments from time to time. As you can probably tell, there are a lot of gameplay mechanics that will be familiar to you if you're no stranger to the turn-based tactics genre, though Demon Hunters has its interesting twists and unique touches on top of it all. 
Every mission you take on starts with a heads up on what you suspect you'll be facing so you can adjust your squad of four marines accordingly, suitably equipped based on what your progression has unlocked and your preferred tools for the mission at hand. Their loadout can include a melee weapon, a ranged weapon, adjustments to armor and war gear like grenades. Within each of these groups of weapons are subgroups as you can see here, and each weapon has its own strengths and weaknesses, as well as associated abilities and modifiers, further mixed in with each marine's own abilities and modifiers derived from how they've been leveled up. You can also pick stratagems that you've unlocked through research, and you can choose to take an extra layer of challenge for extra reward, or not, before diving in. Once planet side, you'll be operating on a grid, concerning yourself with movement speeds and distances, as well as weapon ranges, special abilities, hit points, of course, and willpower, a tool used by the Grey Knights to tap into their psychic abilities and buff their attacks or use other special skills. Movement points and action points are merged into one pool in Demon Hunters, which gives a bit more flexibility, and you can choose to move or move and shoot or shoot multiple times or move and shoot and stab and take cover and set up overwatch you've got a lot of flexibility with all your movement and action points pulled into one resource now again some of this is very familiar ground but demon hunters does switch things up it should be noted that the relatively short ranges of weapons mixed with the relatively large movement ranges on either side of the battlefield means the game almost encourages things to get into punching distances pretty quickly. Since you're outnumbered more often than not, this can be a dangerous proposition for even your hardiest of knights, and should one fall, they'll be able to recover and regain half their health, but should they fall a second time, they're down for good. How this impacts resilience, critical wounds, and permadeath, I don't yet know for sure, but we'll find out soon enough. Two of the coolest elements of combat in Demon Hunters, though, taps into the sheer strength and prowess of these warriors. Destructible environments take on a whole new meaning in the context of this game. Not only are you blowing up cover and the 40k equivalent of explosive barrels, but you're knocking over pillars, tipping over fiery braziers, and literally throwing parts of the environment at the enemy at times. There's a great deal of variety, the use of ragdolls and gory explosions add visual and mechanical flair, and seeing it play out never gets old, and it's just fun to bait the enemy into an environmental trap to level out overwhelming odds. Apart from that, Precision targeting adds an extra layer to the tactical gameplay. When you get a critical hit, either from range or in melee, you'll be given the chance to pick a specific enemy part to strike. Typically, one hit will completely destroy the targeted part, though there was at least one occasion where the same thing could be hit multiple times. But either way, your choice will have a direct mechanical impact on the enemy, either hitting them with a debuff or potentially completely removing one of their abilities, changing how the rest of the battle plays out. This is particularly important in boss battles, where even the slightest upper hand can make the difference between life and death. And what's more, the damage is actually reflected on the unit model. If you chop off a limb to remove an ability, that limb will actually be chopped off. You'll cut open guts, you'll lop off parts, and bits and bobs will explode and shatter in visceral fashion. Like I said, it puts the grim in grimdark, and it's beautiful to see in action. We already touched on the growing threat posed by the warp surges, and we've seen how the world itself will sometimes spawn enemies, and we've seen also some variety of enemies too, with plenty more to still be revealed. I think it's quite clear how Demon Hunters is taking a familiar genre and giving it a nice coat of Warhammer 40k themed paint.
Demon Hunters is releasing in just a few weeks' time, and if you'd like to grab it, using the link in the description and pinned comment down below will help support the channel as you do. Between the few missions I got to play, the conversations I got to have with the developers, and the countless videos on the game's YouTube channel, I'm quite excited to dive into the full game when it drops. If you'd like to keep up with it, and more strategy, sim, RPG, and management games in general, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel, and feel free to let me know your own thoughts on Demon Hunters down below in the comments. I'm always curious to see how others feel about titles I'm excited for. Now, as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time. Cheers.